With each stroke of the panel, 58-year-old Joe Mackay is reconnecting with his Métis ancestry. You know, my great-grandfather five generations ago came in this exact same canoe route, and that just happened to be by circumstance. Mackay is traveling for more than 7,000 kilometers by kayak. It's like that book, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. He began his journey from his home in Banff on May 1st and hopes to reach Montreal by the end of October, paddling on average 12 hours a day. Well, it started out as midlife crisis, pre-planned. So, you know, like 15 years ago, I wanted to do one more big trip before I was too old to do one more big trip. And with 30 years of experience as a mountain guide, Mackay made sure he came well prepared. Right, what I got here is a wheel kit. So for s stuff like dams and things like that. Right, they have here's a big uh, dry bag. And then my bug out bag, which has got sunscreen, um, emergency blanket, sat phone. From hypothermia temperatures to high winds, Mackay has faced every kind of element mother nature can throw at him, including the difficulties here in the Capel Valley section between uh, Buffalo Pound and Lumpston w was a nightmare. I mean, it was, you know, I must cross 30 beaver dams. Makes you wish you had a beaver skin hat and they'd come back into fashion after a while. The route he is traveling on is also one of the many routes Métis fur traders would use to ship their pelts to the Hudson Bay Company in the late 1700s. And they would mark it so they could see it from a distance as they were paddling. An educator for 34 years, Calvin Reset has an extensive background in Métis history. He says many of the country's first fur traders were Métis and French-speaking First Nation people. You know, we're going through this Canada 150 right now, and, and you see lots of this is my story. You don't see too many people talking about the fur trade story, and you don't see too many people talking about buffalo hunting stories and things like that. Back in the valley, Mackay will continue exploring his ancestry. I'm near as tough as they were. They were came from the days when the boats were made of wood and the men were made of steel. And one day make it back home to his family. For me, I mean, if, you know, if you're looking for one good trip, that's a good trip. Chris Anachkate, CTV News, the Kapow Valley. So that was my uh, trip last year. Um, that's what I did most of the summer last year. All right, so the this was my trip. The actual, the major part of the fur trade route sort of came in from here, uh, sort of where the Saskatchewan Manitoba border is, and then this extensively was the Northwest Company's transportation route. Um, the Hudson's Bay Company had a, a post up here and had quite a bit more inland uh, advantage. <clears throat> I get, this is off the Canadian Fur Trade website, and I thought it was really good because it just sort of explains it much better than I can. So I'll just read a little bit of it. The historically, the fur trade played a singular role, role in the development of Canada. It provided the motive for the exploration of the country and remained the economic foundation for Western Canada till about 1870. And the motive, of course, is the same motive we have these days. Is it was money. I mean, it was real money. Um, <clears throat> the fur trade also determined the relatively peaceful patterns of indigenous European relations in Canada. Um, and that, that's pretty true because what was going on below this, this sort of line in the United States was quite a bit different of, from what was happening in the further north. The Hudson's Bay Company, well, we'll talk about that a little later, but, uh, and the Northwest Company had a, quite a bit different relationship with indigenous people than the U.S. did. Um, a central social aspect of this economic enterprise was extensive intermarriage between traders and indigenous women, which gave rise to an indigenous fur trade society that blended indigenous and Europeans customs and attitudes. And who, what did that society become, do you think? The Métis. The Métis, that's right. And it's important here with the indigenous women and then the European traders they were not able to survive on their own in, in this wilderness. It, it was beyond them. Um, but their relationship with native tribes was uh, such that quite often the, the chief would create this relationship with the traders and would offer his daughter for marriage and there would be this intermarriage and then that relationship would spawn children and more marriages. 
Okay, so we'll, that's enough about that. Uh, <coughs> it's, this here is Canada, but look at, these are all different watersheds that we have in Canada, right? So this one goes to the Arctic Ocean, the Pacific, a little bit of it, the Milk River country down in here in southern Alberta, will go to the Gulf of Mexico. The bigger part of it, this is the important part for us, is the Hudson's Bay watershed. And then on the very east side, we have the Atlantic Ocean watershed. So all this water, all drained into this watershed here. <laughs> this red spot in here, that's known in Canada as the Precambrian Shield. So basically, this is bare granite rock that is exposed to the surface. Now, if you want to get to that granite rock and you're over here, like right down below us, well, not right here because we're in the Rockies, but if you're in Calgary or out in the prairies, um, you would have to go down 3,000 feet. But however, when we get to the, the shield, um, you have the rock and it's right at the surface. And that's everywhere. And so we just have a thin layer of soil and then the trees can grow on that so the soil will gather in the valleys and things. Um, but they'll take root. But a campsite like this, anywhere on the fur trade route, this is just a typical one you would see every day. And this is kind of the same place that the fur traders would have uh, camped on a spot like that. On the, in the Great Lakes, you can find one of these anywhere. I mean, and, you know, once you decide you're going to camp, give yourself 10, 15 minutes, you'll find a spot like this, just like that. And this is high water marks. There would be twice as many. Uh, the water was exceptionally high last year because Ontario had a huge amount of rain, like, you know, three times their normal average. But because it's Precambrian Shield with no soil on it, very little soil, then the water just goes through the soil, hits the rock, runs into all the rivers. And all the rivers were in flood condition last year, all the way through into the fall. So they were like five feet higher than their, uh, their normal water for that time of year. So these are the three the, the important areas. One company started here in Montreal, and they had to travel all of this distance uh, with their furs. In actuality, they had to get all their goods to this point here. Hudson's Bay Company, this was the Northwest Company. Now, they were, majorly, they were just two major players in this game. You know, there were some minor ones, but they, they added up to like 3%. Um, so these guys had to go all the way over here, get all their goods over here. Meanwhile, the Hudson's Bay Company pretty much sat up here and all the natives would come and see them and then they would trade their pelts. Oh, <laughs> okay, the yardstick would have been better, but well. Uh, and they would trade their pelts. Let's see what we got. And, of course, and it was all about, um, probably about 90% of the fur trade was based on this little guy here, right? Now, remember, today we have, we have uh, waterproof clothing. But in the old days, you couldn't do that. All they had was like coarse wool, right? And, but it was a great thing to have. And what would they do? Take the under hairs of this um, beaver and they would make waterproof clothing, jackets and hats, um, capes and things like that. And that was a big deal way back in the day. And that, once again, that in Europe, they had trapped out everything. Like there was, the, the quality of the, the furs and that were pretty minimal. It was only, you know, parts of Siberia, and they would never make it back to Western Europe. Um, so the beaver, you know, Canada's obviously <laughs> thinks it's important enough to put on their Parks Canada sign, right? It's like, why wouldn't they put a moose or a deer or a mountain lion or our symbol? We have the beavers on the, so it must be important enough to put on a coin. Once again, we also have, we've had other animals on those coins. And this is one of the major things. This is what a gentleman would wear way back in the days, in the 1600s, 1700s. If you had one of these, that meant you were fairly wealthy. Uh, it's not a great picture, but this is what it all is about. These, the natives would gather enough of these so they could buy one of these. And it, <clears throat> if you think about it, way back then, I mean, these Europeans had came into almost a Stone Age society, right? And the, the need, almost a need for, our, once you had this technology, it's like having electricity. We just can't go back, right? If we turned off all the power in the whole world right now, things would go bad for everybody. Real bad. It would be as bad as a zombie apocalypse.
Okay. So anyhow, the native people had a, a desire for the technology. Um, so they would trade with the Europeans. Um, one of the side effects of this, which is, was pretty bad, was uh, it also introduced smallpox to the native population. And so the natives had never had that disease on this continent before, and so they had no immunity to it. Smallpox still, you know, is a bad disease. If you get it, it's, it's not good. Um, but we can treat it now, at least we have treatments for it. In those days, nobody understood uh, the treatments. If you're wondering how bad it was, you think, how many in this room, let's say 30? Out of a, if you were a typical tribe, 30 out of a, a tribe of 30 people, there would only be three of you left. Wow. So that, that's pretty much anywhere three to four of you left. But that's how bad the disease was. And it followed the inland, it followed it inland with the trade goods. Yes? How did this whole come? It came, well, with one thing, this guy ha has it in, with him because most people in those days had it when, as a child. But they, their parents had it, and their parents had it. So there was some natural immunity to it. Also on the ships, uh, there were rats. Um, and other, there's other contaminants. But simply by man handling these, these furs and then handing them straight over to these native people would be the transfer process for the smallpox. It is quite likely that somebody on the ship had active smallpox at the time also. So they would have come at some point in contact with native people too. Once the smallpox started to break out in the, in the uh, communities, native communities, people would try to get away from it and they would go to their cousin's village, you know, maybe five or six days away or, or and then it would start to spread there and nobody could explain why, what it was because they didn't know. They didn't, it wasn't for quite a while after that even the Europeans found out about it, right? And so that was a bad side effect of uh, the trade. The, the bonus was the technology was, was improved their life. So something like a kettle um, for the women to cook with would been, and steel needles instead of porcupine quills, um, you know, and thread and, and wool blankets and things like that made their, their life so much better, right? But at the same time, it came with a cost. Um, it wasn't an intentional thing. So, you know, we can't blame the Europeans for that. Uh, the major company at the time was the Hudson's Bay Company, and this was their flag at the time. And the Hudson's Bay Company was insanely large. The, the British government granted the Hudson's Bay Company all of this land here. And that was all the water that flowed into this Hudson's Bay. And <laughs> the very arrogance of the Europeans, I don't know, it just, it's mind-boggling to me now to say, yeah, we own this. You know, and you can have this and the people that are on there, they belong to you too. Right, that's it. And that was as simple as that. Everybody that lived there had no say in it. But as far as the British were concerned, this was our, theirs, right? So the native people had, had no say into their, into their land. Another picture of Rupert's land, if you can, gives you just the scale of this thing. You know, it was like the size of Russia. I mean, it was more land than the, the Chinese emperors ruled at any one time. Any Russian czar never had that much land. The other big company was the Northwest Company. And, and they were the cool guys because they, you know, unlike the, the Hudson's Bay Company, they were just Europeans. They didn't want their workers mingling with the natives or, or the native women. It happened, and, and, but they discouraged it. Um, whereas the Northwest Company saw the advantage of people you know, intermingling families because they had to get to that interior and they needed a labor force to deal with getting their goods to that interior. And there was no better way of doing that than having these people intermingle in the, in the central district and then creating a community and then supplying them with all the work that they needed. This is at Fort William with the Hudson's Bay Company. Remember where that was right in the middle? So here's Montreal and they had to paddle all the way down and in the middle was Fort William. And then the in interior was the fur trade country that they had to get to. In the middle of this, though, they had this massive fort. And it was called Fort William. They would meet here for about a month. This is where the workers would stay, or the, the voyagers, while they were there. They didn't just transport the goods or canoes, but they also came here and were a labor force over the summer. 
right? Because they, they, they got paid for the days that they worked, but they didn't get paid when they weren't working. And so all these men would come out with their boats and all the trade goods, and then, uh, well, they would transfer the trade goods through the next set of voyagers to go to the interior. They would be around and work on the farms, um, do the fencing. Their boats would need repairing, things like that. So they had to do all of this stuff and do all this transportation with something. And this, I'll tell you what this is. This is where art and science meet. This is the most beautiful thing you know, you just look at it, right? Not a single nail, not a, not a modern nail of any kind in that. There's no glue. It's all made with natural things that are just right around the forest. And so whenever one of these things got damaged, they could just pull in and fix it. And they just walk into the forest. In a few hours, they'd find themselves a tree, cut out a bit of birch, patch it up with some gum, heat it up. But see how it's all braided in here? There's no nails in here, all of this stuff. These, these are bent and steamed. And they would have, a, where they built these things uh, on certain tribes, they would, uh, they would have entire factories built for this. And, you know, the stakes would be laid out and they could shape the boat and they'd pull it in. And, uh, and the indigenous people came up with this. This uh, um, birch bark technology uh, wasn't unique to just the natives of, of North America, but... I think they perfected it. Nothing was as elegant in design as, you know, the Russians had some other more round shaped boats and things like that. But this, the way it's the design, you know, and how it paddles through the water and how much you could carry with it. So there's what a big full size boat is imagined as, right? So it would have all these men and all these trade. This is a little out of scale. What I found was pointed out to me, see right here, right there, that person right there, that's a woman. That's a European woman. That's, she's the painter of that picture. And uh, it was very rare in those days, you know, I was, I was, unless you were uh, a very influential individual for your wife to actually come from Europe and be in, in the end. Most, most of them didn't want to go, I don't think. <laughs> and what I said at Fort William, this is what the, uh, they'd bring their canoes in, but this is the canoe shed. And their boats, each of their boats would come in. Because of these, these canoes would absorb water, um, they had to be dry, dried out. So they sent, these things would start out at, you know, maybe 150 pounds. But they'd probably be about 250 pounds or something by the time they got to wherever they were going. Then they'd flip them over and dry them out. And then they'd, they'd go uh, each day. So the world that they had to travel in kind of looked like this. Right, and this is just a typical off-the-cuff topo map from the fur trade area, for the fur trade route. And so you can just see how much water there is in here. But more importantly, say you want to get from here and you want to go to here. But you got to, this is like the worst puzzle on the planet. You know, because you're, 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 at A, you're using your body to solve the pro problem and it's going to take you time to do it. And I can guarantee you, having canoed the fur trade route, that there is no possible way a European could have found that route in two or three hundred years on their own. Without the First Nations who knew the routes and the linkages, no one First Nations people knew the whole route. But I got a cousin two villages over, and he knows somebody who knows somebody who knows, has a cousin in the village next one over. And so I can paddle with you to there, and I'll hand you off to my cousin who will take you to meet his friend who knows somebody in the next village. And over a period of, a relatively short period of about 50 years, they managed to link together a trail that took them to the interior of what is now Canada. Remember, no Europeans had been in this place. There are no horses. There's not a lot of information. And uh, to get into this point and that point, um, Oh yeah, I had I had the one to, I had one to fifty thousand topo maps. I had my GPS, I had compass. Um, I also had the topo map loaded into iPad Pro, okay. and then uh, yeah, I was. So the technology and GPS. Made you know, <coughs> well, it made a lot easier. Okay. Fortunately, with my GPS and my topo maps, at a push of a button, it would give me a sense of some numbers going this way and some numbers going this way. I checked those numbers, and bang, that's where I am, and I 
I always carried a pencil in my life jacket and I'd, go, and I'd mark that spot because when I didn't, I'd have to take me a long time to find that spot yeah. again. Where was I? I was, you know, so. So, and it was so complex at times, it was, you would, you would paddle and paddle for hours and hours and then there's this little channel and it's as wide as that little doorway here and I had to hit that channel. I, not that channel or that channel or any one of the 400 channels I went through. I have to hit that one because it turns, a bend, it turns into a lake which has a portage at the end of it which takes me to a swamp, takes me to another portage and another lake and another swamp and a portage and swamp yeah. and that. And these little, you might portage, you know, you might have to carry your boat for a kilometer and then you might paddle for five minutes, ten minutes and then have to carry your boat again. You know? And I was on my own, yeah. So I had three loads, and so one portage would be the equivalent of, say, one kilometer would be five kilometers of walking for me for every kilometer that I had to portage because I had to go back and get my loads and my boat and my gear, right? So this is also beaver heaven because there's water, streams, and ponds, right? All the food they could ever hope to eat. And they didn't have very many enemies until the Europeans showed up. And then they had the major enemies, right? Because you remember, the, the, the fur trade started out over in Quebec, in the St. Lawrence district. But that place got trapped out, and that kept moving further and further and further inland. So within 50 to 100 years, they had trapped out most of the area of, of Upper Canada and Lower Canada. And so they had to keep moving inland. Now the Métis, the people of that were a product of that fur trade. Now, they had lived on the land in the interior for over 150 years before the Canada became a colony of any kind, or a, or a major independent colony, right? Um, and what they wanted uh, at this time, kind of, I guess a little out of the sequence, but they wanted title to property and they wanted self-government before they would allow themselves <laughs> or their land to be appropriated by Canada. And they said, hey, you know, this is it. You want us in Canada? We've been living here for 150 years. You just show up. And what they did, Canada did, they went to the Queen and said, hey, we want to buy that Rupert's land. Right? And the, and the Hudson's Bay saw it in the cards that they were going to lose it anyhow. So they'll take what they can get. And so for about $1.2 million, they get a nation. Right, one of the largest nations in the world. And that's all Canada paid for that entire thing. It was like a real estate deal of the century. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, hey, you know, like, okay, we'll come into Canada, but we want these certain rights, and we want our land, we want title to it, we want to still be self-governed. They had their own government. Yet, in the settlement of the Red River District of the Métis it was probably the most peaceful place in the entire North America, because everybody knew everybody. They all helped each other, they had all grown together, they all depended on each other, and it wasn't until they agreed to uh, become part of Canada that it became a violent place to live, because then Canadians sent out Wolseley and his civil militia troops and a few regular uh, professional army guys, and then suddenly it became the Wild West, and it wasn't even a safe place for Métis people to live anymore when Canada appropriated it. Um, so this guy is Louis Riel. They said, hey, man, we've got to do something. And this guy was about one of the few people that had any education or any dealings with the uh, Europeans or the white people at that time. So he was the political and spiritual leader of the Métis. He set up his own government, and this was the first provisional government of Manitoba. And they negotiated their way in to the Canadian Constitution, and so they were uh, created their own self-government, their own rights to their province, they owned their own resources, um, and so they lived in the Red River District. So this is the Red River District if we're looking at it, and this is about the size of what Manitoba would have been. This is what they wanted for land, and so they wanted it held in trust for the future, for the, for the children. Like, my children and other children. What makes me sad about this is that they were, this nation of people, the Métis, were perfectly set up to become a very wealthy middle class. I mean, they had flour mills, they had farms, they had transportation, they, they were buffalo hunters, and as the Europeans and the settlers came in, if they had entitlement to their land, 
they would have been able to expand their businesses um, and grow with the country in fair and equal terms. And today, I think it would be a much different world that we live in as far as our relationship with the Métis. I think they, you know, if, if we didn't have certain prejudices of that era, um, then we would have quite a, quite a different nation altogether. And I, I doubt we would have be talking about the appropriation of uh, native lands and things like that. Oh yeah, okay, so what happened in 1869 in the Red River District was a rebellion um, and a resistance to being taken over. So they bought Canada, which is, was, where is this? Way over here, right? Like this, this, is, this is how big Canada was at the time. It was kind of like this district right in here. Eh, maybe a little more over to here too. But it was small, it was tiny in, the, in, the world, in that world. Um, but somehow they negotiated and had, and Britain gave them all of this, like all of it, right? Which is just, just plain crazy, right? That's crazy talk. So these guys said, look, we're gonna fight for it. Uh, John A. MacDonald at the time didn't want to have to deal with that. He didn't want to have to deal with a, like a second Quebec. The resistance was broken from that, you know, that provisional government of people. They were broken up eventually. Settlers were moved in very, very quickly. The Métis were, became second-class citizens on their own land rather quickly. But meanwhile, all of this land was still open, and they knew about certain areas in here, and they knew the farming was good. Um, you guys have heard about Patoche, and that place, the farming there is excellent. It's awesome. It's a beautiful place, too, right next to the South Saskatchewan River. Um, so they had another... Uh, Louis Riel ended up having to leave the, his, his homeland, and came down into the United States and was working as a school teacher and was quite happy. Uh, meanwhile, a lot, of, a lot of Native people did an exodus, or the Métis people especially did an exodus and just started moving out into this country where nobody owned the land yet, as far as they knew anyhow. And so they came and they resettled um, many, many of the good farming areas in the interior. Uh, and a lot of them around Batoche. So with my family, we do things like uh, there's an annual gathering at the uh, at Batosh, and so there'll be many people who will gather every year to this thing, and it's called Back to Batosh, and it's kind of like the back to the the place where our, the last big resistance was, and it became it's sort of like the homeland of the Métis right now, or one of the place, places that we call home. <laughs> and so these are the other students that your classmates here, our schoolmates. And we, we went back in there, and they, so they learn a little bit, and they get to mingle and listen to the music, that the distinct music and the dancing, and they have crafts and things like that. In Batosh itself, um, the town is still, you know, intact, and it's rebuilt. It's a national park now, which is really good, so it's going to be preserved and improved on. And the people can come and, and check this out, so it's a very well-preserved area. This here is one of the Métis uh, Red River carts. And these carts were ideal for prairie use. Once again, you can see there's no metal parts on any of this. This thing was all put together with dried leather and uh, wooden pegs. And they would grease these wheels with buffalo grease. And these things would make an awful lot of noise on the prairies. There'd be hundreds of them on a big buffalo hunt. Like I say, and the Métis people were in, a, in the perfect position to, to line up and, and, and become, you know, a, and they would have been great citizens for Canada, I think. You know, they, they were peaceful people, they had skills that, you know, that, that new settlers needed, um, and they, were, they weren't against people coming in to their country, they just wanted some entitlement to their country, and it guaranteed so that their children, like you, would have a safe place to live and grow up. Do you have a question? No. Oh. Okay. Oh. So there's an abattage, this is Gabriel Dumont's gravesite here and he was a military leader for the Métis in that last uh, rebellion. If he, if he was allowed to actually fight the, the rebellion the way he wanted to, he might have had a different outcome. I, it would have been the same outcome probably in the long run, but there would have been a lot more casualties on the European side. So he was more into the guerrilla warfare, which they were the masters at, whereas uh, Louis Riel did, didn't want that to happen. He just didn't want the bloodshed to deal with. There was already enough. So then my kids get to kind of mingle and go in there and have a look around and maybe get a feel for 
the Métis thing, and there's lots of stuff for kids to do there. Like I say, there's uh, anywhere from five to 10,000 people at one time. At, so it's a large gathering, right? Yeah, it'd be a bad time to try to take Batash again. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, that was uh, sort of the, the, about all is I've got for you guys. Because the fur trade is a complex thing, eh? It's the relationship. It's simple, but it's, it's very complex. And you can go on forever. Because the Hudson's Bay Company was modeled after two other companies. That was the Africa Company and the Indian Company. And they were the companies that would take the indigenous people and then find a way to make them work for them. The Americans had a, quite a different point of view. The, the native people were just in the way. And so they're, they're, they just got rid of them. And that was their way of dealing with the, the native issue. So the, the two fur trades, even remotely similar. But I got one more thing for you. I got a modern ghost story. Okay. Now, I, I don't believe in ghosts personally. But sometimes you just got to shake your head, right? So I'm paddling, you know, along this thing, and I'm, I'm out in the wilderness, and I've gone through quite a bit of pain and suffering. And I'm starting to think, you know, at about this point, at that point where I stopped, I was like, oh, man, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Like, I'm going into, I'm, the rest of it had been kind of across prairie. You know, there's some big lakes, deep in Baker's, 200 miles and things like that. And, there's problems with rapids, you know, I'd, I'd overturned twice already, lost a lot of my camera gear. Um, I had all kinds of issues, right? So I was kind of, my confidence wasn't great. And now I'm, I'm in at Lake Winnipeg and I'm going around the corner and I'm going for the first time in my life up a river. And not just any river, the great Winnipeg River. This thing is huge, right? And so it's got a real current to it. And here I am at Deep and Baker Lake. I had to sit here for like two days, wait for the winds to die. Yeah. So I'm going against the current, that's right. And that, that makes it a lot slower and a lot more work. You can't rest whenever you feel like it. Yeah. You gotta find an eddy to dunk into. And this is kind of the prey, I, you know what, I, you gotta excuse my editing a little bit, because I didn't spend a lot of time on this, kind of threw it again in the middle and out it. But I, I saw a bunch of video clips that I put together, it kind of showed what I'd been up to, to I got to this point, where I just turned and I was just starting to go into the Winnipeg River. kind of getting tired and I kind of losing confidence too I was kind of thinking well maybe I bit off more than I can chew because I'm not a natural paddler right 
I kind of like five years ago started taking up paddling because I knew I was going on this trip. So I thought maybe I better do some paddling before I go. You know, it's like otherwise it might be suicidal. <laughs> so, so I did do some, but I, I, I mean, for something like this, not very much, you know. And so I had the Winnipeg River here. This is kind of typically what it looks like. It um, gets w a lot wider and a lot narrower at times. Um, but this here, this is where I kind of, that big scene, that was like when I hit the Lake Winnipeg. And, that, and then I kind of knew I was in a different league of, of paddling and, and travel altogether. And I'd hit there. And so I turned the, the corner over here and I finally had come in. And this delta, this is the delta of, of where the Winnipeg River comes out to Lake Winnipeg. But if you're standing here, this is how big it is. If you're standing here, you can't see the shore on the other side. Right? It's like the ocean. It's literally as far as the eye can see in every direction. An interesting thing about Lake Winnipeg, it's only 50 feet deep somehow. Um, this kind of like typically, you know, what my life would look like every day. I'd be there camp and on rainy days I'd be sitting in there. One friend of mine gave me the book, The Voyager, which is a more insane story than mine will ever be. But, uh, and then, yeah, I'm just living, in, uh, living the life. But, <clears throat> like I say, I, I came... I was traveling up the Winnipeg River, and I came to this place, Lac, Lac Bonnet, and I, I had to resupply, I had to get in some things, so I pull into town, I'm landing on the beach there, and the beach is right in the middle of the town, all the town's kind of built around uh, the river there, and I, I, I get there, and there's like this old man, this guy here, and he's sitting, his grandson is in, in the, you know, swimming in the water, and he's watching him, but this guy's kind of looking at me. And I see he's looking at me, so I start looking at him. He's looking at me and looking at him. And said, so we strike up a conversation, you know, nice day. What I, and he asked me what I'm doing, so I explained to him, yeah, I'm going up this way and I'm on my way to Montreal. He's, and he's, you know, he says, well, you got the map, right? Of course I got the map. And I go, what map? Because I, mean, I had my topo maps, my GPS, and I, I knew I was going into really complex terrain. And, uh, and the, you know, where the, it was, I don't know, I was out of my head. So the, uh, I said, no, I don't know, what about the map? And he explains that there was this parks official from Manitoba Parks and he was a trained choreographer and he could draw maps to scale and he had a history of paddling and he put all this, he made this beautiful map and I said, well, I don't remember even heard of this map. He said, well, you gotta have it, right? And said, but he happened also to be um, in charge of the museum down the road and they had a copy in a dusty drawer on the bottom of that and he knew where it was because he's a bit of a paddler and a historian himself. And uh, so he whips out the last non-smartphone on the planet. And, and he makes a dial, and 20 minutes later, they show up with the map. Right? And so now I got the map, and it's got like look, a campsite with shelter on island. Um, all of this stuff is perfect to scale. This is where the paddler was. He shows the line that they'd paddled around which way around the islands that they had gone. And, you know. And then these big lakes down here, you can easily get lost in any of these things. Right? And it had all this history on it, like local history and things like that. And as I'm reading the thing, you know, I'm going, well, this is great. This is exactly what I need. Now my confidence is rising. At least I have information. Right? So that, that helps me a lot. But, well, I look up into the corner of the boat, and then, and then I see this right, this right here, and it says 1793, James Sutherland and John Mackay of the Hudson's Bay Company arrived in the English River in Alabama, and there was my grandfather's cool. name in the, in, on the map that I had just gotten. And it was like, wow. And still the map had all this information about rapids and dangerous spots and what side of the dams to take out on and where the reserves were, where I could resupply. And so I knew from this point that, you know, there was somebody watching my six yeah. on the rest of this trip. And after that, I was never, like, never really alone. I mean, I ran into this alien, and I asked him, well, how long, how long have you been here? And he said, about a billion and a half years. I said, well, why? He said, well, my ship's in the repair shop. Well, that sounds like a lot, a billion and a half years, but they can adjust their frame rate at such, their life frame rate, so that a billion and a half, you know, like a thousand years to us, would be only a couple of minutes to them or so he told me but he did tell me like around the corner there was this um giant rock bear that eats people that don't know the, the answer to the meaning of life and he said by the way the answer is 47 right so i come around 
And there's the, the giant rock. You can see where he's eaten the clothes of people who didn't know the answer to the, the situation, right? But there, there, yeah, there he was. He, he was scary, and he talked with a deep voice that the water would rumble, my boat would shake when he was speaking. Right? So anyhow, that's pretty much the, the, all I've got for you guys for today.